So, good morning, everyone. There will be class next week. The last class next week. The well, next week we will be meeting. Last one. You're taking the summer off? No. <laughs> <laughs> we need you. Thank you. Oh. So, we'll see you all, God willing, next week as well. But for now, we have two parashiyot to do. Double, double. I think it's a total. We have to feel bad for a Balkora. It's, I think, 244 psukim, right? I just wrote that to my kids. They're expecting this week, so I said... It's just, a busy... Yeah, it's it's a, so we have to take it easy and take it easy on David the whole time. It was my oldest bar mitzvah parsha, so... Not bad, huh? So, page... We're going to start at page 918. <coughs> Matos, which is a lot, obviously, of Matos. Matot, vows, wars, uh, the koshering of vessels, if you want to know Where's the law of how you kosher a vessel, turn to Matos, uh, it deals with the settlement, Matos we're talking about, settlement of God, Reuven, on the east side of the Jordan <coughs> River, that's that Parsha, but then, Masay, is where we're going to be focusing on today. And today we're going to deal a little bit with numbers. You know that in Judaism, for some, numbers is a little bit significant, and for others it is very significant. But there are those that love the numbers and the gematriot and their spiritual meaning and their symbolism. And there are, there are others that accept the fact that tradition teaches us that numbers are uh, important, but they don't go very far. Today we're going to do it a little bit of a number day. And the number of the day, remember, I don't know if none of you watched Sesame Street as kids, but I did. And you watched it as adults, yeah. Watch your kids watching it. So at, 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 in Sesame Street at then, today's, uh, today's program was sponsored by the letter L and the whatever number it was. So today's number is number 42. That's the number of the day, 42. And the, the first place it makes its appearance is in the beginning of the Parsha, which has to do with the journey of our ancestors in the wilderness. And they travel from place to place to place. How many stops do they make? 42. What's incredible is that the Torah, in the beginning of Masai, lists all these locations, right? And uh, David's favorite uh, Dvar Torah, I shouldn't say favorite, one of his, the Divrei Torah he enjoys is that the 25th stop was Hashmona, like Hashmonaim, the 25th day of Kislev. For some reason, uh, he enjoys that one very much in Hashmona. But they go through 40 two different locations, and the text, for whatever reason, spells out every single one of them. What's the idea behind it? Right? Why, why mention it? Now, uh, summertime is a time of uh, travel. People travel and there's planning that has to go into travel, right? Especially nowadays, that you have the ability of even seeing, like in other words, you can look at not just at a map, but if you are predicting that at one, that somewhere you're going to be, you're going to have to make a difficult left turn and you want to get a picture of it, so you go to Google Maps and you get a, an image of the specific intersection and you kind of prepare, you could spend hours preparing, right? You know, days. Prepare, days, okay, days. <laughs> and you can Months. read webs, uh, web pages and have a vlog and a blog and anything you want. A lot of preparation goes into travel. In the past, people prepared for travel. Now, they didn't have maps. I mean, they had maps historically. There were maps, maps that we are familiar with that have a little bit of an idea. It's, I, I like mentioning the fact that until the end of the 16th century, when people in Europe davened uh, to Eretz Yisrael, they davened to the east. At Around, towards the end of the 16th century, uh, Rav Mordechai Yaffe writes, the Lavush writes, that it appears to me we should be also turning a little bit south as well. Like, and I always wonder why did no one not notice that up until then. The idea of location 
only in the was a fellow, a, a fellow, I forgot his name, Aurelius, I think his name, that published the map in 1570. And in it, it became clear that Europe is not just to the west, but it's to the north as well. So therefore, the Rabbi Mordechai Afi sensed that, hey, we have to make a little bit of an adjustment here in Shul. You know, we've got to start turning a little bit to the south. So the preparations in the past, if you are traveling through a desert, have to be with calculations. How many days are we traveling? And if we are traveling for a week, how much water do you need per person per day? How much food, right? How many labor bars? You have to go ahead and calculate things. Yes? In Israel, they have the Shvil Yisrael, which a lot of people do, where you uh, walk from the north to the south or south to the north. And my daughter did it. it took her three months. My granddaughter it took her three months. But you have to plan ahead when you're doing that in, the, in terms of water, like you said. Water. So they figure out how many miles they're going to be doing that day, and they take a car ahead, plant the water in the ground, Wow. So it stays cold, and then they go back and walk it. Well, not bad. The planning I could do is max is where there's a good 7-Eleven to go to cold water. <laughs> but there's more commitment, it seems like, there. <laughs> planning in the wilderness, right? How long will it take? How much water you do need? Now, imagine, imagine a situation that you have a whole nation traveling in the wilderness with absolutely nothing there. It is impossible for them to survive. Clearly, what our tradition is telling us, and this is fundamental to our faith, that our ancestors traveled in the wilderness with absolutely nothing, right? Midbar, Eretz, Lozra, nothing there. No water, no food, and somehow they managed, not a few days, but they were, with their great Jewish talent, had the ability of extending it to 40 years. That was a nest. Judaism, the Torah, the Almighty wants us to remember this incredible nest for eternity. So therefore, it is important to mention the locations. Why? Because if all we would have is a legend that our ancestors spent time in the desert, one could argue, one would believe, yeah, perhaps they were in the desert. But it means that they were just, you know, a half a kilometer away from civilization. It's technically desert. Uh, when they needed, you know, some uh, some food, you know, I'm sure they, you know, they hopped over to some civilization and were able to pull through, right? That could have been how people would explain the miracle of the survival in the desert. You know, remember the Palestinian hunger strike? They had a Palestinian hunger strike. The whole world is up in arms, the hunger strike. But then they put in, they have some video yeah. that he was uh, snacking. You know, he was taking up his, uh, some food. Barghusi was having some food, right? So people could claim that we, right? Yeah, you have a legend that you went through the wilderness. But all it means is that you were night, right next to civilization. This is an explanation presented by the Ramba, the Mora in the book. And therefore... The Torah wants us to know that every single location was way out there. And people knew, right? There were times that people actually identified these locations. And they knew that you were miles and miles, right, away from any source of water, any source of food, and you somehow survived. This is why the Torah spells out these locations. So this is a basic explanation as to why every single name is given. But we're going to have to remember the 42 and what it uh, symbolizes. But let's move on a little bit more before we get uh, into that discussion. Parshat Masay also has the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael. And I, I don't know if you're going to be surprised or not. It includes Yehudah Shomron, just for the record, right? And it includes Hebron, right? Jews do have ties to Hebron, for the record. And it includes East Jerusalem, just for the record as well. And the boundaries are given, fine. Aren't they two different boundaries in the middle of the Parsha, like it's not exact? The, the boundaries, it, there are, first of all, there's a disagreement, for example, when it comes to Hor Hahar, which is the northern boundary. Is it in Lebanon or is it in Turkey? So there are, there are some disagreements among the, the authorities regarding that issue. Uh, historically, we never have had this complete boundary. We also know that during the, the max they reached was in the first temple period, second temple period was much, much less. So there are lots of discussions as it relates uh, to boundaries themselves. But then, page 926, 926, 
is when the Leviim are given their cities. Leviim have a very unique mission. God Almighty wants people to work, by the way. God Almighty wants people to settle the world. This is the will of God. At the same time, God wants the people of Israel to settle Eretz Israel, and obviously it's far more significant than when there is a Jew settling Eretz Israel and has a... Uh, has a, 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 a functional, a job that does good for society. Meaning, you run a casino in Eretz Israel. I don't think you are involved in the mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Israel. That's my personal opinion. But on the other hand, if you have anything that is good for Yishuv Alam to settle the world, any such position, anything that does the good for society, it is an incredible mitzvah. And it is something that we have the privilege in our lifetime to see and celebrate. When theoretically, for thousands of years, it was a concept, now it's a reality. So you go to Israel and you see a crank, or even if you see a worker that is sweeping the floor, he may not be recognizing the significance of what he is achieving. You should meditate there, maybe not staring at him because he may not appreciate it, but you can think about the significance of what is occurring. At the same time, we recognize that as Jews, we need people to fulfill the will of God through work, but there have, we have to have educators, people that inspire people, remind them of their mission, teach them Torah. And we have the Leviim. The Leviim have that very unique mission. The Leviim are not to focus on agriculture. They're not... Can, are you good in that, in planting the... Oh, I'm terrific. You're terrific. Okay, so I see here. Uh, You're not a lady. So when, when the Messiah comes and you'll be given a city of, of Levites, of one of the Levite cities, you're going to have a little bit of a different uh, job uh, to take over there. And that's what we are told here. Page 926, 926, uh, chapter 35, verse 2. Tzavet Bnei Israel command the people of Israel, meaning they just got their ancestral regions. They're all happy. But it's not all theirs, but they are the give the Leviim, Give a section to the Levites. And remember, there has to be a migrash. It is very important that there is a migrash, an open space. Meaning, it is important not just that they have cities, but they have some open space around. Now, in verse 3, we are told, and this is how the rabbis read it, that besides the open space migrash, you give them additional migrash, additional open space for their uh, animals. Okay. Now, the, 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 the Torah is very precise here, very, very precise with the areas given to them, how, uh, how wide this... Um, Boundary has to be around the city. If you look on page 927, you will see the different opinions. But obviously this is significant. The Torah doesn't want just to give them a few apartment buildings for the Leviim. But rather, this is a city that is given to them. Now, how many cities get do they get? So verse 6 on page 928. Ve'et ha'arim asher titznu la Leviim. The cities that you shall give to the Levites... What are you giving them? Number one, et shesh arei hamiklat, asher titznu lanus shamarot. Number one, there are cities of refuge. You know the rule that if someone un unintentionally kills, <coughs> if it was uh, an act that was impossible to avoid, he's obviously not responsible. But if there is one some level of responsibility, the person has to be exiled to the city of refuge. To the city. didn't live there, did they? <coughs> the Livium didn't we'll live in there. We'll see who lives in those cities of refuge. They well, did live they there They actually too? live there. Yes, yes, yes. There are six of them. There are six of them, such cities of refuge. What we are told in verse 6 is the following. The cities of refuge are, is where the Levi'im live. In addition to the six cities of refuge, in addition you give the Levi'im another, how many cities? 40. 40. 42. 42. Ooh. So now the Torah do, it, it doesn't express, expect us to know the math, right? 42 plus 6. So therefore, in verse 7 we are told, Altogether there is going to be 48. 
you needed that, right? 42.6. And what we really should be asking is, if there are six cities of refuge that are given to the Levites, okay, so uh, uh, people who are, I'm not going to call them uh, complete criminals, but people who are negligent in very uh, significant areas, life and death, it was recently, they had in the news here of an Air Canada flight, mm -hmm. right, in, in San Francisco, that it's like a, mir a miracle that it somehow did not, that did not, uh, that it landed on the round taxiway, and you think to yourself, uh, I mean, again, we don't know anything, right? We don't want to, we have to judge, uh, be, be, be silent, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. right, that the idea that you have people's life in your, lives in your hands, there should be a focus there in the cockpit, and obviously when we're going to be listening to the recordings of the conversations, you sure hope that they were not talking about, you know, some boxing match that's going to occur in a few weeks. In other words, we hope that they were focused. Human life is important to us. When a person is negligent in that area, uh, they need to go through a process of education. Where do they land up? Where do they get that education? Where do they grow spiritually? Levim. Among the Levim. So now the six cities of refuge have Levim. You hear this? You're going to have to deal with them. So get prepared. <laughs> the six cities of refuge have Levim. The 42 cities of the Levim, you know what they do in addition to the fact that the Levim live there? What's going to happen? Those type of people, the people who have to go through a process of recovery, land up there as well. So the question we have to ask is, what is the difference between the 6 and the 42? So the rabbis tell us the following. The rabbis say that the 42 cities are cities of the Levi'im. They happen to serve as well as cities of refuge. And therefore, if such a criminal <laughs> lands up in one of those cities, he's expected to pay rent. It's really a city of the Levites. In addition... If he lands up there by mistake, it doesn't serve as a city of refuge. He has to have kavana. On the other hand, the six cities are cities that are completely designated as cities of refuge. It happens to be that for the city to achieve its purpose, what do you need there? Levim. So that's the difference that the rabbis make between them, and that's how they read the text. And that's what the Torah is telling us, that it's really 42 for the Levim, but there are the additional six. What, what is this all about? Now, before we get into the understanding of that area, the Mikrash, the fact that there has to be an open, undeveloped land, what was the purpose of that undeveloped area? So the rabbis tell us, Rashi shares with us, Lehiyot Lenoi Leir. The Torah demands, it doesn't make a recommendation, but rather it demands that the cities of the Levites look beautiful. This is a must, okay? Why is it important? Well, Eretz Yisrael has to be beautiful. You have to go to Eretz Yisrael and see magnificent places and say, wow, this is given to the people of Israel by the God of Israel. No Eretz Yisrael, there's a concept that appears in the Talmud, Tiferet Eretz Yisrael. It has to be a place that inspires. And therefore, when you go to Israel and you see areas that are not meeting uh, the Torah requirement, it's a disappointment. I remember a few years ago, there was a fellow by the name of Pindrus, I think his first name was Yitzchak Pindrus, who was the, uh, the deputy mayor of Yerushalayim. At the time, I don't know if he still is, I don't, it obviously he's not in the news, but he was here in Toronto, and I asked him the question, I asked him the question of, uh, with all due respect, you know, Haredi neighborhoods, which are Torah devoted Jews, what about the garbage? You know, what about, you know, well, let's, let's face it, there's a problem there. Tiferet et Eretz Yisrael. The Talmud tells us that when you walk in the streets of Yerushalayim and you find a coin and you are not sure the status of the coin, does it have sanctity because perhaps someone in Yerushalayim dropped it and he was going to use it to purchase maaser, maaser sheni goods, and perhaps the coin has sanctity. So the Talmud says the following. If you find it during the Chagim, when there are people there from the whole land of Israel, you assume that most of the coins, most of the money used for purchases in Yerushalayim during that season are from maaser. The rest of the year, you can assume that they are chulin, that they are regular coins. Why is it? In other words, maybe 
during the year, maybe right now I'm in Yerushalayim, I find the coin, perhaps someone dropped it during, you know, Pesach Olamon, or perhaps the days after Shavuot. So we are told, worry not, because Shvakei Yerushalayim Asuin Leitkabed Bechol Yom. The streets of Yerushalayim are cleaned daily. Now think about it, 2,000 years ago, right? I was doing like a little bit of research on the history on, uh, on, on sensitivity towards the environment. And they start around the 17th century in London, right? Which, uh, I don't know what they would say about Leeds, but <laughs> they, they start in the 17th century London. Our tradition teaches, be sensitive to the beauty of the city, right? This is so much part of our Judaism. So he gave a good explanation, which I accepted, and he says that when you do city planning, the city planning for a family of two adults, two parents, right, two children, is going to be very, very different than two parents and 12 children. And he, write, he, he, know, he noted that many of the neighborhoods in Yerushalayim were neighborhoods that were built for uh, normal-sized families, whatever you want, or families that are smaller. And then you have the Haredim who move in. And Kenai Nahara, they have 12 kids. He says the whole structure is going to be even the size of the garbage cans, and or or how do you work? Are there, you are going to have that challenge. And he noted that in newer neighborhoods that were designed, or newer cities that are designed for larger families, these issues do not exist. So I, I like that explanation, right? And when we're, we're, it's interesting that Rav Lau was once asked about this challenge about you're supposed to keep Eretz Israel beautiful. What about in the more religious neighborhoods? He says, listen, with all due respect, I live in Tel Aviv. I live in a high-end neighborhood of Tel Aviv. And I walk to Shul on Shabbos. But I would enjoy what I would like to do on my way to Shul, holding my talit, was to meditate about prayer. But my focus the whole time is to be sure not to step on the dog waste from everyone that's walking around there walking their dogs. So he noted the issue of a lack of sensitivity is not just by one very specific community. All of us have to, <coughs> have to improve in that area, that we have to keep this land beautiful. It's the will of the Almighty, it's Eretz Israel. Now, often, uh, values like that, right, the environment, uh, people think that, you know, there's Torah, where you're supposed to focus on mitzvot and the study of Torah, and there are these ideas that the world out there has, for example, uh, being sensitive to animals, uh, animal welfare, the environment, protecting the environment. But what Judaism wants is that a person should realize that that is part of Torah. Judaism wants that the city of the educators, the Levites, the Leviim, where when people go there, right, not just criminals would go there, people would go to the, the city of the Leviim to hear words of Torah, to be inspired by their commitment. They wanted them to see, look at the beauty of the city. Because when you see a beautiful city, you are inspired by it. And you remember that this is part of Torah as well, that things should be pleasant to the eye, especially in this land. And this is a language that is used by early authorities already. This is so much part of our, of our tradition. That's what we are told. So that's giving us a little bit of an insight on the Migrash Lenoi Ha'ir, for the beauty of the city. But now what we really have to focus on in our question, <coughs> and what our class is going to be about uh, today, is the, is the numbers. There are 42 cities given to the... Levi'im. In addition, six more, which are really not theirs, but they are cities that are there for the people who kill unintentionally and a city of refuge. So let's focus on number 42. Where in Judaism do we find the number 42? So let's go through the list. So far what we have in this week's Parsha, uh, we have the 42, the 42 stops. stops, and we have 42 cities. Uh, where else do we have uh, 42? So according to some, in the Bet HaMikdash, when the Kohanim would do Birkat Kohanim, and they would utter the name of the Almighty, they would utter not just Hashem or uh, you know, Adon, the master of the universe, they would utter a name that had how many letters? 42, 42 letters. So now you're entering into this real uh, mystical <laughs> realm here. 
So 42 has to do with some kind of relationship with God. Right? It's, it symbolizes somehow, somehow, a relationship to God Almighty. It's interesting that if you count all the korbanot that Balak and Bilam offered, it actually adds up to 42. They're trying to tap into the 42. Like you could do the math. You could, uh, but there's one other, uh, one other occurrence in the beginning of Book of Melachim, of the second Kings, which is really just the continuation of Kings 1. Uh, Eliyahu Hanavi makes his way up to heaven. Remember that? What kind of uh, chariot did he take? A hot one, uh, right? Uh, a, a fire, a fire chariot. And uh, his disciple Elisha takes over the role. Takes over the role. And we are told that he was uh, agitated. He was agitated by uh, some people. So the story goes as well. Listen to this story here. Elisha makes, he passes Yericho. He passes Yericho. And there are people living there. Next to uh, historical Yericho. And by the way, if you're ever in Yericho and you look at the Jordan River, you are looking at the location where Eliyahu made his way up to heaven. Because we are told that it was right there crossing Yericho and it happened to be the same location where our ancestors crossed into mm -hmm. Eretz Yisrael. And it happens to be that just as our ancestors had a split, they had a split, Eliyahu also had a split. Mm -hmm. So much of our history is in that region. Now, people of Yericho come to Elisha and they say to him, listen, uh, Moshava Yertov, we live in a good city. These are like very uplifting people because things are good. We only have one problem. The water is bad. Now, the water is bad in a place, that's a crisis. You've heard of Flint, Michigan, right? It's a real significant issue, bad water. You can't survive. Civilization, cities, you plan them or you only settle where you're going to have water. <clears throat> so it's time for him to perform a ness, a wonder, a miracle to go ahead and deal with the water. So what does he do? <clears throat> so he takes some salt, takes some salt, he goes out to the spring, throws the salt in, and he says, in the name of God, I shall cure the water. And from that point on, there was good water. Okay? It's interesting that uh, the issues of water are usually the issue of salt, right? Desalinating water is what the Israelis are known for, right? He had him and uh, Moody, in, uh, they had, there was a picture, you saw the image? of uh, them going into the, yeah. the water without their yeah. shoes. Mm -hmm. And obviously the Indians are much better in walking into water because he knew how to roll up his pants better than Netanyahu, it appears, if you look carefully at those pictures. <laughs> Netanyahu does not have you know, that, the experience in that field, but he had to do it uh, to so, welcome uh, Mr. Moody. But the idea that here we have a country, limited water, what do you do? Figure out a way how to go ahead and it's scientific. Anyone that has any seichel, anyone that has open eyes with no hatred, realizes that there's something quite incredible, supernatural happening in that little country. If you want to hate, you can hate from today till tomorrow. If you want to open your eyes and recognize reality, uh, they are the most inspiring people on planet Earth. No question about that. So now, he, the, the ness is that you take salt and you throw it into the water, and that is what takes care of the water. Fine. Now, he passes Bethel, and the rabbis tell us that the people of Bethel were fuming, fuming at Elisha. Because they were in the business of bottled water. They were in the business of bottled water. And there was a significant market for their bottled water. Why? Because people in Yericho had bad water. Where did they get their water? From Bethel. So Bethel was supplying fresh water and charging a premium, like Perrier, or like even more, what's the Avian, or what are the expensive people that import their waters from different places. So they're playing, playing the, their, uh, nothing against these companies. So the, they're fuming at Elisha. So obviously they decide to insult him. And their master, their mas the master of Elisha, Eliyahu, had a lot of hair. Elisha, on the other hand, was bald. Nothing wrong with that. He was a great person, but, but this is just what the text tells us. So they did decide to insult him. And they said, Ale kereach, ale kereach, you baldy, why don't you just go up with your master as well? 
So here you have a person who's supposed to lead the generation, and these young ne'arim uh, ktanim, ne'arim ktanim doesn't mean that they were young children, but they were acting foolish. These were people with an attitude, not concerned, not, you know, not, not recognizing that this is a person that's going to lead them. So uh, he, he, due to the fact that he's a man of, man of God that was uh, insulted, the result is that they get punished. What happened? Two bears come out, and 42 die. This is what the text tells us. Fine? So what do we have here again? 42. 42. So some, okay, good. So we have the 42. Let's try to understand what 42 is about. So it works as follows. The, you know, that... Uh, it's, it's, if 42 symbolizes a relationship to God, Hashem, and if you agitate the man of God, you're <clears throat> agitating God. And if, the, if Bilam and Balak want to relate to God Almighty, they tap into this number 42. What does number 48 symbolize? Right, Torah. Yeah. What, 48? Yeah. Before we get to 48, and again, today's a day of numbers, uh, 48 is Torah. And how do I know that? Because you open Pirkei Avot, and we are told that to acquire Torah, there are 48 ways. Barbaim, Mishmona, Rechem Okay? By the way, there were, when you, we count, up, count the prophets, the prophets who taught the words of Torah and their teachings became an integral part of Torah, there were actually 48 of them. So, yes? How many days are there from Rosh Chodesh Elo to Yom Kippur? There are 40, there are 40, 40, 40. and as there are every, you know, 40 symbolizes always a complete change. Mm -hmm. There's a list of, uh, we, we can have our discussion of today's 40, National 48 Day, right? We have, to, uh, we have to go ahead and deal with that and come up with an explanation as it relates to that. So what we're going to argue here is as follows. 42 is a relationship to God. Uh, it's very nice to want to connect to God. It's very nice. So many people are, spiri are seeking spirituality. We are believers that the way you connect to God is through the Torah. And you have to have that bridge between the 42 and the 48. The 42 and the 48. What connects 42 to 48? The 6. So it works as follows. 42, 42 cities are given to the living. They are spiritual people. They relate to God. But to reach the true values of Torah, they need 6 additional ones. What were those six additional cities? Yeah, cities that helped other people. Helped people in recovery. Helped people to get back on the proper track. We have? Rehab. Rehab. Rehab indeed. And this is, what, this is the message of Torah, that people think that being a spiritual person is to be locked up in a monastery, in a base medrash, and not interact with society and just pray and study Torah, right? Obviously, that's necessary, but if you ignore the needs of society, that's not Torah. Torah is to reach out to those who are in need. The six is what connects it. You know, I have uh, a friend, he's older than me, and he's a rabbi in Leeds. I've mentioned him already a few times. His name is Shalom, Shalom Cooperman. Uh, Shalom Cooperman is, when it comes to greatness in... Uh, in, in Torah Hashkafon, meaning not just Torah knowledge, which he is a tremendous Torah scholar and a brilliant man, but also in understanding priorities and direction. He is a very wise person, a very wise person. I knew him when he was younger, and uh, meaning I know him would go back already some uh, you know, 24 years, but he's a very, very wise person, and he had a lot of good stories, and everything I heard from him was words of wisdom, and I understand you can look. Have you ever reconnected with anyone back there in Leeds or... Well, I have people there, but I haven't met Rabbi Kippur. Nakover, okay. So, man, you know, anyway, he's the one... Next time. Please. Next time, good. So you'll keep up, and you'll, you'll mention that I mentioned good things about him. So he shared, years ago, a story with me. And again, I'm younger, and uh, he was more of a, like a guide. So this was a very significant story that he shared. He shared with me the following. That there was a yeshiva, there was a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael called the Hebron Yeshiva. Hebron Yeshiva. Where is the city? Where is the yeshiva? Yerushalayim. 
Why is in Yerushalayim? Because it was in Hebron in 1924. It was established in Hebron, where they sent six students from Slabotka, which is a suburb of Kafna, to establish the yeshiva. Among the six, as you know, was my grandfather. Aaron Milevsky was one of the six. When I wrote uh, the author of a book on the on the Iran on the on the yeshiva itself, he was so excited that he sent me a copy of the he has the ledger of the yeshiva and their expenses in the early years, and he said to me that on the first page he showed me a picture that on the first page, like on the fourth line, one of their expenses was you know the boat Aaron Milevsky's boat ride. Uh, to, to the yeshiva. So he established yeshiva in 1924. They study there in Hebron. It grows. A lot of American kids came to the yeshiva. And Hebron, that's the place they decided to be. There was a philosophical decision there as well because they didn't feel part of the old yeshiva and they didn't feel part of the new yeshiva. So they wanted to have their own identity. A very incredible yeshiva. Unfortunately, 1929, there's a massacre there. These animals come. They butcher 67 or 69 people. Among them, kids, uh, a, very, a high proportion were kids from North America. There was a kid from Memphis, Tennessee, that got, uh, that got killed. Study you now the father, imagine that. You're in Memphis, Tennessee. Someone comes to raise funds from Hebron. You decide to send your kids in those days, in the 1920s, to study Torah and Eretz Yisrael, and that's the result. Anyway. So the Hebron Yeshiva moves there to Yerushalayim. The leader of the Yeshiva from that era, from the 19, from early 1930, the real head until 1969 or 1970, is a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Cheskel Sarna. Rabbi Cheskel Sarna. Okay, the name is a well-known name. The Sarna name. Do right, you have a friend? Uh, Sarna as well. So the Cheskel Sarna, she was here in the class, that's right. <laughs> so Cheskel Sarna is a very wise man and he educates Torah scholars and there are great people that came out of that yeshiva. One of the students in the yeshiva, so a lot of names here you have to remember, right? <laughs> but so far, important for this part. Sarna or Sarna and a student by the name of Shlomo Hoffman. Shlomo Hoffman is studying in yeshiva. A good boy, very wise, learns a lot of Torah. Gets married, gets married, becomes a, a therapist, becomes a, a counselor, and he works in the Israeli jail system. Goes to jails and he works with inmates, right? Recovery, where they, he gives them the ability to deal with their anger, with their past, with their issues, assists many of them in making their way back into society. society. That's what he does. Fine. So he's doing it as a young man, as a 20 year old, 30 year old, 40 year old. Eventually he also became a little bit, years later, as a little bit of a mashkiach and a yeshiva, but he was doing incredible things. He's a legendary, uh, a legend indeed. So as a young man, as one day, right, he has, uh, he's out of jail and he's, he's somewhere in Yerushalayim and he meets Rabbi Sarna. He meets Rabbi Sarna and Rabbi Sarna says, how are you doing Shlomo very well? What are you doing these days? And Shlomo apologizes and he says, you know, really, I, I feel bad. I should really be in the Bet Midrash learning. I should really be in a kolel. But I'm, I'm working. I'm, I'm working in the, in, you know, in the, in the jail system. I, uh, and he shares with Rabbi Cheskel Sarno what he is doing, assisting people to get back on track. And his tone was one of apology. Rabbi Cheskel Sarno turns to him and says, Shlomo, if you are apologizing for what you are doing, we failed as a yeshiva. If you, have to, if you are helping people to get back on track, right, to return to civilization, to assist the people that need assistance more than anyone else, and you are apologizing to me, the head of the yeshiva, for what you are doing, we failed completely as an institution. This is the story. The power of the story is because that's the essence of Torah. You assist people. You go out there, right? You take the 42, which symbolizes a relationship to God, which is wonderful, but you are not complete as a levy if you are only Mr. 42. If you're only thinking about Hashem and the Shem Hashem, you're not a complete individual. When do you become complete? When you add six cities of refuge, where it's their cities, these are jails, right? They are there for a period of time. Our jails are good jails because you have their educators. Imagine if today the jail, today a jail system is what? That if you go in with one tattoo, right, and a member of one gang, you come out with perhaps 20 
or if you learned, if your small criminals turn into big criminals, why? Because who are they interacting with? Who are inspiring the young 19-year-old that lands up there? Here and there, you'll hear a good story of someone that somehow got inspired, right? But overall, right, it's a failure. If you imagine, if you have, imagine if in Israel they do that, that they take people from yeshivot, right, and they put them in jails, right? They can go out, they're 9 to 5 only, obviously, but the goal is interact and help people, assist them. That is the six that takes you from just being a spiritual person and makes you a Torah Jew, makes you a 48, makes you a person who is really fulfilling the true vision of Torah. And this is what we are told in this week's portion. There are 42 cities, Levim. Yes, there has to be the six, which symbolizes this idea. You are assisting others. That is what Torah is all about. This is what uh, this is the message, and this is a powerful message. He told me this, Roy Cooperman, uh, years ago. I, I confirmed it last towards the end of last week. I sent him an email just to confirm the story, and the story is a confirmed one. But uh, the message is indeed a very important one. So we had our forty-two and all their, uh, their all their sources. And hopefully we could uh, walk away with the message of the 48. The value of Eretz Yisrael was addressed as well. And now we have a little bit of Parshat Masay in our pocket. Yes? Were there, does anybody know where the, the 48 cities were? Is there lo, are there locations anywhere? So when it comes to the six cities, it is easy yeah, to the locate six them. The six cities right? we do know. We have Hebron, we know exactly, with, we know where they are. And also Shechem is one of them. So we do have the names. When it comes to the, to the other 42, there are references to in Tanakh, but not all of them. Were they strategically located okay. to be close That's, to other cities? Because they're pretty, according to the, there's, there's three measurements given in, in Art Scroll. Right. According to the Rambam, which is the biggest me measurement, they were only like one and a half miles by one and a half miles. So not, not a, that's including right. the big garage. Right. So it's not very big, right? According to the Ramban, it's a, it's a they larger, were, they were very small. Right. Very small, maybe a couple of hundred feet by a hundred, couple of hundred feet. Like not, not very big at all. So these so are not very large, not very so large. So were they areas? just districts within a bigger city? Like, were, like did Yerushalayim have a city of Levium in it, or did? So it seems to be that the Levite cities were complete cities, and that really served the need more than anywhere else. These were small. I think they have more of a symbolic message. They existed in reality, right? And it could be that it didn't include a complete city, but it was an area designated for them. We don't know. Have a list of all the other forty-two, but. The assumption is that uh, the, they are, you know, throughout the country, and that obviously they were larger. Levim were usually smaller. Again, the Levim were not. It's always interesting to note how the Kohanim Levim. Uh, but the Kohanim didn't such, live there. But the Kohanim didn't have no. The Kohanim did not. Even though, even though, if you think about it, where did they li live? So if you look, if you look in the in the Kinos of Tisha B'av, there are references that seem to indicate that they were members of that community as well. Huh. So it seems there, to be. Is there any significance to the 48 being 49 you, uh, With numbers, there's always room to come up with uh, uh, more of a, of a, of a drosha. There's a, a, a Vilna Gon that says the following, that Moshe Rabbeinu is Mr. 49. Why is he Mr. 49? Because he's above all the prophets. So 48 symbolizes the prophets. And he says, Rabot banot asu chayil. Ve'atalit al kulana. So, Rabot banot asu chayil refers to the prophets. What's chayil? What's the numerical value? Chayil, 48. 48. Ve'at, and you, Moshe Rabbeinu, alit al kulana. You are number 49. So, that's the, so there's a lot there. Anyway, thank you so much. We see you next week for our last class of the season. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. When it says the name of the city, is called Sachem. When you have a shoulder. Better? Usually it means when the author uh, wrote it, and it's in the prophets. Yeah. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I have a story about Yeah. Did you turn it off, David? You're being filmed. Thank you.